But the Baron was no fool. As the chief forester of Baden, it was his daily duty to patrol the miles and miles of forest paths. His draisine made the job much easier. This was the first discovery of the magic of the bicycle. The Baron von Drace had made a great new discovery. Man could now travel faster and farther with much less effort on wheels, using only his own horses, no engines, no sails, just his own muscles. The Drazine, simple and crude though it was, had such a basic appeal that similar cycles were soon in use in many countries world. A man walking could travel only four or five miles per hour with steady, continuous effort. On a Drazine, a man could go five or six miles per hour on level ground and could often rest while coasting downhill. But of course the Drazine itself was heavy and awkward to handle. So by about 1860, man's mind had extended the magic of the bicycle by adding pedals. Pierre Lallemand was given a patent in 1865 for this new form of bicycle called a velocipede. The pedals were attached directly onto the front wheel axle. This leverage created new speed and ease, and the magic of the bicycle flourished. There were no rubber tires yet, so iron bands were used around the wooden wheels. Little wonder then that velocipedes became known as bone shakers. Nonetheless, they were very popular throughout the 1860s. By 1870, however, the magic of bicycling took a new shape, that of the high wheeler. This new form was to become so universally accepted that it would soon become known as the ordinary, and it was one of the most popular bicycles of all time. There was a very specific and practical reason for the high wheeler's popularity, speed. Some very smart fellow had reasoned that on a velocipede, Every time he turned the pedals one full revolution, his bicycle traveled forward exactly the circumference of the wheel to which the pedals were attached. So he then reasoned that to go forward faster, he simply needed to attach the pedals to a larger wheel. And he was right. When six-day bike races began in Madison Square Garden in 1891, Plugger Bill Martin won the first one by covering 1,466 miles, or over 244 miles per day. What an accomplishment in sustained speed. Little wonder then that the magic of the bicycle captured the fancy of mankind. Here was an opportunity for speed and mobility for the individual person that could not be matched in any other way. The last two decades of the 19th century were truly the first golden age of bicycling in America. The magic of the bicycle excited man's imagination, and improvements began to come swiftly. High wheelers became higher still. The highest one ever known had a front wheel diameter of seven feet. They became too high. They were hard to mount. It was hard to reach the pedals. They ran like the wind downhill or on level ground, but were hard to pump uphill. They were unsteady and were prone to spill easily and dangerously.
so by 1866, another clever fellow, an Englishman named James K. Starley, had figured out a way to make the bicycle safer without sacrificing its newfound speed. He made the wheels smaller and more nearly the same diameter. He placed the cranks and pedals between the front and rear wheels on a frame and used a chain to drive the rear wheel. In doing this, Starley had created a revolutionary application of the age-old principle of gears. Rather than delivering the rider's muscle power directly from the pedal cranks to the front wheel axle, Starley's sprocket and chain drive delivered the muscle power to the rear wheel axle. What was the advantage in this? Watch. Because the front sprocket was large and the rear sprocket was small, one revolution of the pedals generated far more than one revolution of the rear wheel. Hence, speed with safety through the magic of the first bicycle sprocket and chain gear. John B. Dunlop of Ireland had invented the first practical pneumatic tire, making the bicycle more comfortable and efficient. The diamond frame safety, developed in the last decade of the 19th century, became enormously popular and created a bicycle industry in America alone of over 300 bicycle manufacturing plants. The safety bicycle became one of the primary means of utilitarian transportation as well as pleasure riding. In the spring of 1933, a man named Frank Schwinn, whose company had been manufacturing bicycles since 1895, introduced the balloon tire bike, the forerunner of this kind of modern utility bicycle so familiar to us all. Or this, 40 or 50 miles an hour with nothing under you but 19 pounds of high precision machinery on thin racing tires, pumped tight with 120 pounds of air. In this new golden age of bicycling, bike racing is once again becoming a popular American as well as Olympic sport. This national bicycle track racing championship caps off an annually increasing number of bicycle racing events throughout the country. East and west, north and south, there are more and more bike tracks being built. And where there are no tracks, more road races are being organized. These races are promoted and encouraged by the Bicycle Institute of America and sanctioned and officiated by the Amateur Bicycle League of America. The riders, such as Charlie Hewitt and Gordon and Ed Rudolph, seen here, maintain their amateur status and compete to represent America in the Olympic Games. This is Jackie Symes of Gloucester, New Jersey, the 1964 American National Bike Racing Champion and a member of America's bike racing team for the Olympic Games in Tokyo. His own words, as quoted in a recent article of Sports Illustrated, best express the magic challenge of championship bike racing. It's like, mm, boy, it's, it's like an explosion of everything inside of you. You have your bike adjusted so that you're not riding it at all. You're running on the pedals. The tension is building and building there inside of you. Then someone makes his move, the snap. And there's a big, wild blur. The tires are going zoom, and they... Hello, Mr. Warren. Why, hi, Bill, Billy. Say, where did you get those racing bikes? These aren't racing bikes, Dave. <laughs> well, they've got those funny-looking handlebars and high seats. Isn't that uncomfortable? No, not at all. In fact, they're a lot more comfortable, especially if you're going to ride for any length of time, because you have better weight distribution. Look. See, Mr. Warren, Dad's weight isn't all resting on the saddle. His shoulders and arms share in the load, and leaning forward cuts down wind resistance, too. 
Besides, you have better control of the bike with drop bars, and you can use your arms like shock absorbers to smooth out rough spots in the road. You can vary your hand positions for greatest comfort or for an especially hard uphill climb or high speed or for greatest overall control. Well, that looks all right at that. Say, what's all this apparatus down here, though? Is it some kind of special gear? Yes, Dave, it is. It's called a derailleur, and it gives you 10 different speeds. You see, there are two sprockets in front and five sprockets in the rear, hence 10 different possible combinations. And it's very easy to shift gears by simply moving one of these levers, although you have to do it only when you're actually riding the bike. Why is that? That's because what you're really doing is making the chain glide across from... Pleasure cycling enjoys a long season, even in the more northerly areas. Here, just outside Boston and late in November, the eminent heart specialist, Dr. Paul Dudley White, enjoys a bicycle ride with a friend, Dr. David A. Field. Dr. Field is director of physical education, health, and recreational studies at the University of Bridgeport, Bridgeport, Connecticut. Dr. Field, that was a nice ride. Grand. As we take off our bicycle clips, you might like to know the history of, of the two pair. You have a silver pair there that was given to me as a Christmas present about two years ago by a young colleague of mine in our heart group. Now, he's interested in the circulation as I am, and he believes in bicycle riding too. This pair was given to me in Baltimore at the time of the heart drive last year. And it says on the clip, Maryland Heart Fund Kickoff, 1963. So they also countenance the idea of, of exercise of this sort. And I put this next to my gold stethoscope that Ike Eisenhower gave me uh, last year at a dinner in New York as a sort of souvenir of my activity. The, you see the bicycling helping the heart. That's interesting. I wonder if you'd explain again, Dr. White, uh, this relationship between cycling and health. Well, Dr. Field, it isn't simply for health reasons that I favor bicycling as an exercise. I think it's very good from the standpoint of pleasure and economy, but it must be done safely. And now to get at the health angle. There are four reasons I give for vigorous leg muscles, not simply the arm muscles. And the first is physiological. We as bipeds need something to help us keep the blood circulating up from our lower, the lower part of our body. And the leg muscles are very important for this reason. They squeeze when they contract, they squeeze the veins and the veins have valves such as this one in my arm, which I demonstrate frequently to prove the circulation of blood, which William Harvey uh, used in his in his uh, description of the circulation of blood back in 1628. If I press the blood out of my arm vein, where there's a valve there, and then release my finger, the blood circulates up from below. And the leg muscles squeezing the veins actually pump blood up toward the heart, and this allows the heart to receive more blood to supply our brain with blood. This is physiological, and uh, therefore, the it, we have proof that it isn't simply the heart that's the only pump. The leg muscles are pumps, and the diaphragm is a, is a suction pump. So by keeping physically fit, we help the heart out in its action. Psychologically, too, uh, exercise such as that of uh, cycling can be walking or swimming, but bicycling is an especially favorable type of exercise. This has a very good effect on the on the brain, on the mental state, and on the psyche. It's the best antidote 
this kind of muscular exercise for stress and for uh, really mental fatigue. It should be, we shouldn't work all the time. We should, we should balance mental effort with physical effort. This is what we were really constructed for uh, physiologically and anatomically. And instead of using tranquilizers, <clears throat> I advise uh, muscular action into the point of fatigue so that you won't need medicine to tranquilize you. And then we have a great problem today, and I've had right along, since we no longer used our legs properly, of uh, being subject to thrombosis, that is blood clotting in our leg veins. And these blood clots, which can form when there's too, can get established when there's too much stasis, sluggish circulation, uh, this is a hazard, a great hazard to life because of pulmonary embolism. Blood clots can go from our leg veins to our lungs and kill us, and are very serious often. This is a third reason. And the fourth reason, and perhaps most important of all, is that there's clear evidence now that vigorous use of our muscles helps to delay the onset of arteriosclerosis, which is the modern epidemic in this country today. These, then, are the four reasons I give for uh, the vigorous use of leg muscles, such as that perhaps best performed on bicycles. Well, you've convinced me, Dr. White, of these values on my health. But uh, what about finding a time and a place for cycling? Well, Dr. Field, we've already seen the pleasurable aspects of cycling and uh, the fact that this is being done in, in a fair number of places in this country, but not enough. We must develop more and more uh, facilities for safety cycling, train people to cycle, even on the roads of today, but we also need paths to make the cycling more pleasurable as well as safer. And I would add that we can use bicycles even indoors. In the winter where the uh, cycling is very difficult outside, there are standing bicycles of various types, home training uh, machines that are going to be still more improved to allow us to use our own bicycles indoors. This will be not only pleasurable, but healthful too. But we still have a great deal to do in our communities. This should become a way of life, not only for pleasure and health, but for economy and for safety too. But now we have a considerable difficulty in persuading the countryside, the communities, the cities and the roads, but not enough of the human himself. And so I would like to close with just a quotation uh, from Edwin Mark. In vain we build the world, 